All right, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome in as we are near the end of our May spectacular month here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world, and never have we done that more than this May. Just last weekend, we wrapped up our Global Biodiversity Festival, the biggest program not only that we've ever done, but to my knowledge, the largest conservation program in history, with 150 broadcasts over 72 straight hours from over 50 countries and every single continent at least twice. So hopefully you guys get the chance to check out that website, check out our ever slowly but surely uh, growing list of those programs being featured on YouTube and more. It's a really special opportunity to learn from some of the world's top conservation stars. We also, of course, have our Backyard Bio Global Nature Campaign happening all month long. So if you haven't checked out backyardbio.net, Get there after this broadcast. We are really encouraging people to get out, exploring the natural world near them, sharing photos of all they discover to connect in a love of wildlife and nature. So hopefully you get the chance to see all those things and keep the excitement and learning going. This is our third of a triple header today. We started the day uh, out learning about the beginning, uh, the basics of the brain with Dr. Emma Niel all the way in Wales. We just wrapped up a minute ago learning about wild bears with Matthias Breiter, some of the most amazing photography we've ever featured on this broadcast. Today we are wrapping up our, our program slate with one of our all-time longest standing speakers and partners, Dr. James Herrera. So he is with the Duke Lemur Center and he does amazing work to both conserve wild lemurs and to really build up the community in terms of environmental education and sustainability initiatives live in Madagascar. And so it's always a privilege to get to hear from him. Today we're going to learn about some of those amazing programs that the community is doing uh, and see some really exciting and, and new things from the Duke Lemur Center today. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Herrera, and take us away. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you for having me back on. It's always a pleasure to be on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I'm really excited to be able to um, be a part of this month where you guys have been blasting with all sorts of amazing environmental education material, and uh, to be a, a part of that. And also the Backyard Bio has been a lot of fun and a really great way to get people engaged. And so it's, I felt it would be fitting this month to talk a little bit more about what the Duke Lemur Center it does in terms of environmental education in Madagascar and how we believe it is fundamental to, the, you know, it's a cornerstone of conservation and, and sustainability. So bef before I jump right in, uh, in case you haven't caught earlier programs on exploring about Madagascar, I'll just give you a quick reminder. It's that island off the southeast coast of Africa looks small next to Africa, but it's actually the fourth largest island in the world. It's about the same size as the state of Texas, and there's almost 26 million people living there. They are called the Malagasy people. And here in this map, I'm showing uh, in green the forest cover, and white is non-forest. And so that can be savannas, grasslands, uh, farmlands, you know, towns and, and cities and things like that. And the Duke Lemur Center has our conservation program in what's called the Saba region. It's an acronym for the four main cities, Sambava, Andapa, Goimar, and Antala. And uh, this is what it looks like at the top of one of the mountains in Saba. This is in the park, uh, uh, Marajeji National Park. And it is a rainforest, a mountain rainforest, as you can see. Part of the reason it is so uh, big and pristine is because it's such treacherous, difficult, uh, conditions to get out there, very remote and steep. And you can see just clinging to these rocks is all this jungle and hidden in that jungle are the lemurs. So this is the silky shifaka, which is one of the species that's largely endemic to the Sava region. So all lemurs are endemic, meaning they're only found in Madagascar, but this is a species that's only found in this one region of Madagascar. They are the primates, as you can uh, see already from their grasping hands, opposable thumb, and on their feet too, um, their forward-facing eyes. And uh, this species is actually critically endangered, meaning it is a, at a high likelihood of going extinct in the near future if we don't act soon. We believe there's probably only 250 uh, adult animals and they've never been kept in, in captivity, only found in the wild. Another charismatic and flagship species is the Indri. Uh, this species is also found in Savo, although it has a, a broader range heading down uh, further in Madagascar. It's uh, the largest living species and it's quite famous. If you've seen any documentaries about Madagascar, you've probably seen Indri and you've probably heard them. So 
these lemurs live in family groups where a male and female will sing these duets and it's a way of uh, demarcating their territory. They're yelling, hey, this is our turf, you better stay away. And it's a way to avoid uh, fighting with other groups. So there's about a hundred different species of lemurs. Again, they're the primates, just like monkeys, apes, and people, but only found in Madagascar. They're a unique branch of that primate tree. Um, they range in size from the smallest species, the mouse lemurs, which fit in the palm of your hand. They're about 30 grams or an ounce or a little more. Um, and they are out at night hunting insects, eating fruits and flowers, along with their uh, uh, another species called the dwarf lemur here. Then these are some nocturnal leaf eaters. And then you get the famous eye eye, which uh, specializes on eating insect larvae like grubs that are in the wood, you know, among other things. Got lemurs that are like tiny pandas feeding almost exclusively on bamboo. You get the famous ringtail lemur, of course, and many of the larger day active or diurnal species eat fruits. And when they eat those fruits, they actually swallow the seeds and they go through their guts and they, when they poop, they poop out the seed with a little fertilizer packet. And research has actually shown that the seeds grow better when they've been eaten by a lemur than when they haven't. So they're really important in their ecosystems. They're also sadly very threatened with extinction. So I mentioned how the uh, silky shifaka is critically endangered. 90% of lemurs are actually considered threatened at a high risk of going extinct. And this is based on an international team of experts who get together and you know, refine our estimates of where we think they live and how many there might be. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a growing problem. And the main thing that is threatening lemurs is habitat loss. So by that, I mean deforestation. So here again, I'm highlighting in red the Sava region in the Northeast. And this is a set, uh, excuse me, this is a, uh, an aerial photo taken from plains of the uh, forest cover back in 1950. You can see it was quite expansive and well connected. Uh, and then fast forward to 1970, there's a lot of political and social things that were going on at that time, which led to a lot of deforestation. You can already start to see that the forest is becoming um, more discontinuous, more fragmented. And now closer to the modern time, 2017, the forest has really contracted. It's mostly only in these rugged mountains like I showed in Marojeji, which is uh, right here. And, uh, and most of the forest that's left is now part of protected areas. In fact, 20% of the forest has been lost in the Sava region just in the last 20 years. So what is causing this deforestation? It's, it's not like you know, what we see in a lot of other countries where it's you know big bulldozers and, and industrialized commercial agriculture. It's actually mostly from small scale uh, agriculture and farmers using a traditional form of agriculture where they'll cut and then burn the vegetation. And by doing that, they can clear the weeds, they get rid of pests, the ash and char gives a quick boost of nutrients that, that they can use to then farm. But you have to also think that, you know, they're not evildoers, they're not doing it because they hate the forest. They're they're kids who grew up learning that this is how we farm and their families who are just trying to feed themselves and feed their families. Most of the farmers aren't producing enough food to sell. It's all for home. And then they face problems of food insecurity. So here, the, uh, you know, a mother showing proudly her rice fields with beans and corn. These are staple crops. But if we zoom out to the landscape, you see that this has this effect of kind of creating this patchwork or mosaic landscape. We're down here in the lowlands, you see a lot of agriculture like the flooded rice. And then on the hills here, you can see a few burnt patches that they're about to farm. The lighter green is regrowth, which we call fallow. And so the people will let some areas regrow and then they'll return to them after several years and cut and burn again. But you see as the, as the land you know, and the, and the forest that they can clear starts to dwindle, they move further and further up these mountains. And here you can see the tree line this is actually the boundary of a national park. So in many of these mountains where there are no national parks, the deforestation continues and you know there's just no forest left. The soil becomes eroded. You can see down here a big erosion gully. The land literally just gives up and becomes unproductive for the farmer. The farmer has to move on. In places in Western Madagascar where it's really dry, um, you know these are habitats where the trees and everything are adapted to the dry conditions people have used fire to clear land so frequently that, you know, they just really can't, the forest can't recover. 
and uh, it's, it's really becoming a serious issue. I'm also going to warn that I'm going to talk a little bit about another pressure facing lemurs, which is um, collecting lemurs from the wild, either for pets, like what we see here, or for food. And so frequently, you know, people will uh, find lemurs and they capture them and they'll bring them back to the village and they may keep it as a pet. They'll think of it as kind of like a toy for the kids to play with. They might try to sell it. Uh, and there are other um, people who might try to buy it, like in hotels and things, because then tourists like to see the lemurs at the hotels. All those things are really uh, difficult because first it's illegal to hunt or capture or possess lemurs. And also they're so endangered that we can, it has a really big impact on their populations. So another problem with this is lemurs are really hard to take care of. Here at the Duke Lemur Center, they've been specializing on how do we take care of lemurs for 50, 60 years. It's really difficult. So many of these lemurs, you know, they're tied up with a rope. That's not really the best way for them to get around locomoting like natural. It's eating some moringa leaves here, which are just kind of the leaves that they have in the front yard. So many of the animals don't survive and they'll die because they're not taken care of. They also just don't make good pets. Uh, lemurs can be very aggressive. They've got super sharp teeth and big canines and they'll bite. And so if, if the animal bites someone, you know, the, the owner might just get rid of it or kill it. And one way or another, it ends up in the cooking pot. Lemurs, so I'm going to warn you, the next few pictures are kind of gory, so you might want to turn away if you are squeamish about it, but it's the reality of things in Madagascar and something that's coming to my attention much, much more lately, but is hunting for food. Um, in many places, the people, you know, just rely on hunting as a way to get their wild meat. And here, the, what the hunters do is they'll cut a patch of forest because the lemurs prefer to climb in the trees. So with no trees around, they're forced to go along this bridge the hunter created. And then there are these snare traps uh, that can that the lemurs pass through. Sometimes they're baited with banana, sometimes with poison. And here you can see a, a dwarf lemur uh, that's been caught in one of these traps. And the next picture really uh, still brings a tear to my eye, but this is the Ai, the famous lemur that is emblematic of the DLC. And in many places in Madagascar, many people consider this animal to be a bad omen. It's like a black cat, but much worse. They believe that if they've seen an eye eye, that means that bad luck will come to them or their family. Someone might die. And so they have to kill the animal to prevent that bad luck from coming to them. Uh, sometimes the lemurs can also be a pest because they eat the coconuts in the coconut plantations. And so people will kill them for that reason. But actually, interestingly, you know, this is the story about the eye eye, but new research has come out that's shown that there's a lot of variation in people's perceptions about eye eyes and other animals. And actually, the eye eye can be a friend in the, in the forest. They can eat some of the insect pests in the, glow, in the clove plantations. A colleague of mine was just telling me about this. So really, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that we can kind of try to think about how we can change those uh, perceptions about lemurs such that we respect the local traditions and the local needs, but we also protect the biodiversity. So, you know, you can come back if you're averting your eyes. Um, this is, you know, a topic that I, I touched on in my last presentation, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are 17 goals that we as a global society agree are really important to our development and our future. Things that we can all agree with, like to end poverty and end hunger, have better health and better infrastructure, protect the environment. Today, I want to focus on goal four, quality education for all, to improve the access of quality education for all, at least to a primary school level. Um, and this is a goal I think we can all really believe is important because there's this famous saying, and I always butcher it, but you know, you're only going to love what you know about, and you're only going to conserve what you really care about and love. So if you don't know about the things, it's really hard to get behind uh, a movement like conservation. And, you know, as is the case in many low income countries in the world, Madagascar has uh, a difficult time with education. The infrastructure is not where we want it to be, obviously. And, um, you know, these are some data that we collected as part of a research project in this region. We interviewed 350 adults uh, in villages where we do some of our other projects about what's the highest level of education they attained. Well, on average, about 10% of people, you know, adults, never had the chance to go to school. Then you've got, you know, the majority of people got at least primary school, 
a smaller subset got to go to secondary school and an even smaller subset went to higher education. So we can imagine how it's really difficult to uh, really in internalize why the forest and why lemurs are important to us if we've, if we've never learned about water cycles or about photosynthesis, about how trees make oxygen for us. You know, we, we have to learn about those values that the environment has for us. And the Malagasy people have a lot of reverence for the environment. I don't want to make it sound like they're just using the environment for resources. They know the trees very well. They appreciate that, um, you know, they have to manage their resources, but they're facing a lot of challenges. So we're trying to help improve the education in many different ways. And I'm going to start with some new initiatives that are really exciting uh, for me and for local partners. And from here on, I'm going to tell about uh, Everard Benesuavina. Uh, so if I start to say we and things like that, it's really just Everard and his team and partners, a big collaborative effort, but he's doing a lot of the hard work. He is um, a conservation activist, just really has it in his heart to bring conservation to the region. He's participated in biodiversity research. He's an ecotourism guide and an educator. So we uh, at the DLC have been partnering with Everard to be our education specialist. So he, in all his work, he saved up all his money to buy a piece of land not far out of the main city of Sambaba, which was pretty much deforested before, and he has now restored it by planting diverse fruit trees and native species. And he now hosts uh, visits for kids and adults to come to his land and learn about it. And he has dubbed his uh, land the New Generation School Garden because he really feels passionately about uh, empowering the next next generation of conservationists. He and his teaching assistant, uh, Mario Lis, use a variety of different teaching uh, techniques. So kids learn, everybody learns in a lot of different ways. Some are more visual, some are more auditory. We know we need to be more actively engaged. So here they're using a, a, a visual aid called the Kit Madere. It's locally made in Madagascar, and it's kind of these cartoon um, pictures which help for them to show and tell as they give this narrative about biodiversity, why it's important, how human activities are negatively impacting the environment, what we can do to be more sustainable. Um, we've also been starting a new campaign that we call like the lemur awareness campaign. We've come to realize that um, there's just a, a limited um, appreciation and understanding for the diversity of lemurs in Saba region and, and what their value is in the environment. So we've created a lot of different materials and lesson plans, focusing more on local flora and fauna, including this poster, which is specifically about the lemurs of Saba. So the kids are always fascinated to learn about all how, you know, there's I think about 20 something different species of lemurs really only found in Saba. Most of the kids know about mouse lemurs and dwarf lemurs because they've seen them in the forest fragments or maybe they've had them as a pet or, you know, something like that. They know the ringtail lemur because it's the most famous one and it's on all the cartoons and, and things. But many of them don't know the silky shafaka, which is right in their backyard, or the injury. And so it's about, um, you know, increasing their awareness in, in a lot of different respects and then why those lemurs are so important. So here the kids are, are um, uh, using a, a lemur activity book and coloring book that was produced by uh, colleagues and shared with us. And uh, the, they have... Um, lessons in both English and Malagasy, giving all sorts of reasons why lemurs are important. This one in particular is about uh, describing lemurs as the gardeners of the forest because of that seed dispersal we were talking about earlier. So each of the kids gets a different page and he learns that or she learns that uh, page and then they put them together on these posters, these collages, and each kid gets to be the teacher and teach about what they learned. And then they hang them up on the wall of the new generation. So his his uh, school garden and interpretive center are gonna be decorated with all this artwork. We also use nature journaling. And again, Everard is, is pioneering all of this, but we've been co-creating these different plans together. So uh, nature journaling is like a different way of engaging with the material and lets kids do it in their own way. Um, many of the kids are too young to read and write, so they like to draw instead, and that's perfectly great. So we also do a uh, nature scavenger hunt. The kids have to go out and find um, leaves of all different shapes, sizes, colors, bring them back and um, describe them, draw them in their nature uh, journals, and then Everard identifies them for them so they can learn about the local flora. 
and kids draw what their favorite things were in the garden. Like here, they've got the Ravenala, which is the national tree of Madagascar. It's a really important tree to their culture and the ecosystem. And then here, of course, one of my favorites is mango. Uh, so uh, all the kids get to go out and plant trees. They're, here they are putting in seedlings of fruiting and native trees, and they put a little plaque to commemorate it. They come back and for multiple visits so they can see the plants growing. This is a native tree called a pandanus, which is very important for local people. They actually harvest the leaves to make woven baskets and woven mats. So important for the ecosystem, important for the people, and they get to learn about all this as they restore the land. Um, they learn about organic vegetable gardening. So here everybody's pitching in to um, establish a new uh, bean uh, vegetable bar garden. And as they go around doing the tour, they are collecting food that they find that uh, Everard has grown, like here on the left, uh, picking passion fruits, which are some of our favorites uh, from these giant vines that he's got on these scaffolds. And, eggplants and pineapples, no shortage of jackfruits. And Everard really emphasizes the importance of having these diverse vegetable foods so you have a nutritious diet. And then of course, everybody pitches in to make lunch and they get a nutritious lunch. This is a really big deal to me because, you know, most, almost all the schools, they don't have a, a cafeteria, they don't have a school lunch. So kids often have to walk home for lunch, you know, sometimes an hour or more. And then they walk back to go for the afternoon session and then back in the evening. Here they get to take a break right after class and get a big belly full of delicious rice and beans, which is a staple. And uh, you know, images like this just always make me really uh, happy to see everybody having a good time. The kids uh, get a, a certificate of lemur awareness where they uh, detailing what the, uh, you know, they learned in their lesson plan and that they sign it and Everard signs to show that they participated in this lesson and they write in their notebooks summaries of what they took from the lesson, why they think lemurs are important. And, you know, this is still a program that we're piloting. So we're uh, figuring out the kinks and seeing what works and what doesn't. We get feedback from the kids. In this particular one, we got a pretty good evaluation. We got 10 out of 10 kids saying that they uh, enjoyed the program. They learned new things about lemurs. They would recommend this program to a friend. They would definitely return. So I, I'd say it was a really great success. And Everard is just he just led another visit today. He's got another one scheduled tomorrow. He's getting on Backyard Bio too, so we can all participate. So yeah, it's really, really exciting. Um, I just wanna uh, take a few more minutes to talk about how we don't want it to end with primary school, right? Ideally, these, these kids would get higher education, but unfortunately, that's just not the reality. There's this bottleneck where there's this smaller subset of students who have you know, just beat all odds and gotten to the university level and they are hungry, they're motivated, they are super smart and ambitious, and they know the local um, issues better than anybody. So we collaborate a lot with the local university in Saba region. Uh, here, Christoph Manzari Bay, who's the director, he has a really innovative model where they bring in guest scientists and speakers from all different uh, universities around the island to give more focused workshops and lectures. And here we collaborated to do a workshop on you know, what is the scientific method? How do we do science? And so we invited uh, two collaborators. Here's Andulalau Rakutu Arison, who is a herpetologist, meaning uh, reptiles and amphibians. She's described ooh, dozens of species of endemic frogs in Madagascar and is a specialist. And this is a long-term friend and colleague of mine, uh, Tanzana Rabian Dansua. He's a theoretical ecologist, which is as scary as it sounds. He's really, really smart, but he likes to break it down on the basics of how do we do science from making a hypothesis to how do we design a study to collect data to test that hypothesis? How do we read and write scientific articles, which is challenging for all of us here. And for a lot of these students, it's their, you know, English is their third or fourth language. How do you read and, and make graphs, things like that? They also um, gave presentations about what their research interests are. So these are um, seniors at the university who are gonna prepare an honors thesis and so they um, gave a short pitch about what their research interests were. And this way the leaders, the workshop leaders could give them feedback all throughout the workshop, really help them refine their ideas. Um, and we used herpetology as uh, an example because uh, one of the professors at the university, Fulgence here, he is a herpetologist as well. He has um, doing his PhD studying the diversity of reptiles and amphibians in Saba. 
he's actually just discovered a new species of frog only found in Saba. And so they're starting a natural history collection. And with our support, they were able to um, better catalog all these specimens. So in these jars and on the trays, you've got snakes that he's collected because we need to document these species. You know, you have to have that, that representative specimen of the new species, we call it a type specimen, to which you can then compare all the other specimens. And that's what they're learning how to do, how to describe species, um, things like that. Back before COVID, you know, when I got to be in Madagascar with the team, we uh, participated in workshops like bringing the students out to Marajeji for field ecology and conservation and to learn about uh, biodiversity with the rainforest in your backyard. They learned botany, uh, herpetology, of course, and also about butterflies. And then this it wasn't just about learning and you know having a great time. These are skills that then transfer because then those same students went on to do research with different organizations. So here's Romeo and Jean Juo who were part of that workshop, but then they went on to collaborate with WWF to do lemur surveys. And in a previous talk I did for exploring, you, you, you may have seen that, I've talked about Edgar and his team of student scientists who have been doing this lemur conservation research. Um, you know, he's doing his PhD, Edgar, and Fenu Telesi and Suzanne are doing master's degrees, and then you've got collaborating with local uh, patrollers. They're, they're about to do another mission uh, just next week, so wish them luck. They're going to bring that new lemur lesson plan out with them, and they're going to do research and, and uh, education. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, I think I planned a little bit too much for this talk, but I just want to fly through a couple of slides, and then I want to give you all time for for questions and, and we can have more of a discussion, but I've also talked in some of my other presentations about uh, how we're getting the students at the university involved in a lot more agriculture training, because we talked about how agriculture is kind of one of the main causes of deforestation, right? So how can we find more sustain, sustainable ways of farming? Well, guess, guess what? There's tons of different crops that can grow in Saba. One of them is vanilla. So believe it or not, most of the world's vanilla, which is here climbing on these trees and here, comes from Madagascar. It's an orchid vine, so you can see how it's climbing on the trees. And it's a super, super specialized crop that's really difficult to grow, it takes a really long time, three to five years before you get your first crops. But it's a huge payoff because it is worth a lot of money and so the farmers can make a lot of money from it. So we have growing collaborations with different vanilla organizations to learn proper best practices to teach the students so that they can go on to teach others. And that's exactly what they're doing. You know, back when I was there in 2019, we trained university students in how to make home vegetable gardens. And they went on to train now over 200 farmers. I like to highlight here our deal who is leading this. He's a professor at the university who's also doing a PhD in agriculture. And one of our standout farmers, Jean uh, Genot, excuse me, we work closely with the local schools. So here's one of the um, primary schools where we do uh, a lot of these collaborative projects. The student forces come out ready to help out. They don't just teach, they do, you know, they get their hands dirty too. Here they were collecting soil to fill thousands of small plastic pots. These are the little plastic pots that we then plant the seeds and we watch them germinate and turn into these gorgeous tree nurseries. So here we've got fruit trees like avocado, native trees in the background. This is cacao where we get our chocolate. And then they're training the farmers in how to take care of these trees, how to properly plant them and maintain them, distributing them to the farmers and doing one-on-one -on -one consultations. So far they've distributed over 4,000 seedlings with these 37 participants. And we have active uh, research going on to follow up with them. We've got another student who is really in keen to learn more, uh, Angel. She's studying about our fish farming pro uh, program. So here the, the school and you know the DLC had collaborated to make a fish pond, which got destroyed in a cyclone. You know, the walls were breached, lost all the fish, but the farmers weren't disappointed. They were ready to get back to work and rebuild. And they built back better, as we like to say now. And you know the farm is now thriving to the point that they actually had a harvest already. And they harvested 13 kilos of farm raised fish. Um, they distributed those fish to local participants who have made their own fish ponds. They sold some and bought a new chalkboard for the school and the kids helped. So they got to take their portion back and they got to have that school lunch that I was saying that they don't usually get to have. So this was a really nice treat. 
I could go on and on and I, I, I'm gonna cut through and just show you how, you know, these are all the students. Every time that we're talking about our programs, these are the students, the farmers, they're out there getting their hands dirty, teaching, learning together, having this exchange. And um, one of the new developments we're really excited about, spearheaded by some of the female students, is uh, women's farming associations. So here, Emilienne is always diligently taking notes while she holds these focus groups, and uh, uh, Melissa and all these other wonderful students who are engaging local women to empower them in having home gardens as a starting point, because the women are really key in agriculture, but they usually are kind of left out of a lot of these training opportunities um, they often don't have much land because, you know, land usually gets, um, you know, men get preference when it comes to the land. So, you know, they may only have a little backyard plot. That's exactly what these gardens are meant for. And uh, we couple that with nutrition training. So here's one of the professors from the university who's specialist in nutrition, Nestorine, who's uh, talking about what she calls the Sakafu Maruluku program, um, meaning the food of many colors. Because we know that foods of diverse colors are packed with all different vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, plant chemicals. We don't even know what they do, but we know they're good for us. And so, again, it's not just about teaching. It's about doing. So we gather up all these um, locally available foods. But unfortunately, because people are, you know, they really need money. They're, they're looking for every way they can try to make a little income. When they grow these fruits and vegetables, it's mostly for sale. And so here... You know, we're really emphasizing keep some of those yields at home, proper hygiene because they get their water from rivers. You know, we need to treat that water. And of course, everybody gets to share in a big group lunch after. So with that, I'll take a breath. I'll just say that, you know, Everard is leading more and more of the environmental education and lemur awareness programs and teaching other teachers in Sava so that they can extend this throughout the Sava region. Edgar is going to be helping out with a lot more of that in these remote forests. We're going to have another women's agroecology workshop next week. So wish, wish the women's team well, and um, we'll keep you posted. I always have to thank our team, Charlie Welsh, our conservation coordinator, and Lantu, our project coordinator. Everard, who's just joined the team this year, but we really uh, owe a great debt to him. The whole CURSA team, you know, can't fit them all on one slide, and the student groups. Of course, the grants and the donations that make all this work possible, and, you know, if you like what you saw, please spread the word and share with your network. So I'll stop now and take your questions. James, I, I honestly, on a personal note, because we have lots of time, we've got our, our one live class, we've got a bunch joining us on YouTube. I just want to say it's so amazing to see every single time we get the chance to chat all the diversity of work that you guys are doing. I, I really can't think of any other group that we partner with at Exploring by the Senior Pants that is like covering all the bases. You guys really do it all to enact conservation to make sure that the next generation is inspired and excited to address every single concern that people could possibly run into in, in Madagascar and as a model for what people can do around the world. And I love that every presentation we have, there's always a point where we go, oh man, you know, I'm going along here. But it's always because we want to showcase all these amazing stories yeah. of the community. And this is the essence of what conservation is, is and is at its best around the world, is actually getting people locally involved, not just involved, but vested with a scale of passion and enthusiasm in you know, sharing this broadcast about the conservation of their own lands and of the future of that land for their children and beyond. And so really, truly like an absolute privilege. And uh, so thank you for this great presentation. Um, thank you. If I, if I could just say there, I mean, I appreciate the, the kudos and, and I really... I think it's mostly because I just always try to pack it all into this one talk, but I do feel like I'm, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. We've built on other programs that have done all this and more, you know, idols that we, we as primatologists and conservationists all have, like Jane Goodall, you know, she's been doing this for so long. My advisor, Pat Wright, has spearheaded a lot of this kind of conservation, interdisciplinary conservation. The Duke Lemur Center takes a lot from their early days down in um, with the Madagascar Flora and Fauna Group, which is still a close collaborator. So lots of really great places doing this kind of work. And uh, yeah, you guys have been hosting them, so you know them better than anybody. Uh, I'm gonna bring up, uh, again, uh, your website up on our screen. I'm gonna leave that for pretty much the whole broadcast because people should really check that out. If any one of our groups today wants to check out, uh, again, conservation at its best, more of what James is talking about, donate to their amazing work. Do check out that website. It's really spectacular stuff. I'm going to take a quick question from YouTube. Mr. Audie, I'm coming to you guys for a couple in a minute in Halton. Um, but I love some questions that we've been getting on YouTube. So, Miss um, Ryan's class wants to know, 
Let's see. Oh, actually, this is a great question. Maybe not so much. Students in grade six studying ways that Canada helps with global issues. How can we get involved from Ontario? Okay. Well, um, I always like to start by saying that we can all do a little bit of, of this kind of conservation from with the purchases and decisions we make every day. So keep an eye out for all those in, you know hidden ingredients that are potentially sourced from unsustainable places. For example, palm oil is one of the ones that gets a really bad rap. You know, there's some sustainable palm oil out there, but there's so many other options out there. We know that palm oil is causing a lot of deforestation. We can just find alternatives. Even coconut oil, which is often proposed as a sustainable alternative, that's, that's questionable sometimes too. You just really gotta look closely at where you get your stuff as much as you can buy locally, you know, buy from your local farmer's markets instead of these products that are coming from, you know, far away and treated with chemicals. Vanilla is a great example. Really look at the at where you're getting your vanilla. There's um, organizations out there that have been doing a ton of work to do what's called the Sustainable Vanilla Initiative. And that is a, a consortium that really analyzes closely, you know, are these coming from good, reliable sources that there's no deforestation, there's no child labor, things like that. You know, when you're buying your electronics, even, you know, thinking about, you know, the, the products like Coltan that are in most of our electronics and how they're harvested out of the Congo, like, got to think about these kinds of things. Talking more locally about Madagascar, I mean, Duke Lemur Center has always thrived with volunteers. We've had an active uh, volunteer program and we've all learned how to go remote and virtual these last years. So if you want to volunteer remotely, we can find ways for you to participate. Just, just get in touch with us via the website as as uh, Jesse was showing, you can always, you know, share it with lots of your friends and, you know, consider the Adopt a Lemur program, for example. It's a symbolic way of helping out the Lemur Center or donating to Madagascar programs. Um, you know, there's, there's always kinds of different drives that we do. Like once we did, um, as part of some research and training with the animals, there was like a phone drive, a, a cell phone drive, because they wanted to use the cell phones for research with the animals. And, you know, there was tons that they just didn't need. And now I'm going to actually be able to bring those to Madagascar to give to the local park rangers so that they can use cell phones to better communicate. Stuff like that. Yeah. Just keep your eyes out. We'll find ways for you to get engaged. Very, very cool. I love those tangible options. And one thing that I love about Madagascar, I mean, it, it's a it's a darker backdrop story, but it is one of the poorest countries in the world, which is a tragedy in a lot of ways and leads to some of these conservation difficulties. But it does mean that your money goes a really, really long way to helping conservation initiatives in a way that simply would not in Canada or much of the world. I mean, a thousand dollars Canadian, thousand dollars US, can help pay for a, a staff member to do an entire year of like, surveys of conservation work. And that's a really special opportunity to make a, a big difference with your money if you are going to donate to a cause. So, thanks, Miss Ryan, for that, that great question. Um, Mr. Roddy's class, joining us in Holton, grade six and nine. Uh, come on in, guys. <laughs> All right, thanks uh, for having us today. So this question comes from Hashida. So you mentioned that the farmers burn the land to farm better. Um, is the government doing anything about this either proactively um, or reactively? Like for why are the reasons they're not providing enough food for Madagascar that they have to burn um, to farm to do? So is there anything, any information you can provide on that? Yeah, um, I will say that since the early days, you know, it was it was legal. Um, and so the, the, the official government policy is it's illegal. If you get caught doing it, you'll get a fine. You could be jailed. Um, sometimes they would have other things like you'll have to go replant trees. And so we do see a lot of that kind of legal enforcement. So, I shouldn't say a lot, many times, but not always. It's just too big a country. There's just too remote. And, you know, um, as you can probably tell, like just saying, no, don't do that isn't always going to fix the problem. And um, so... Yes, more recently, the World Bank and a lot of organizations have been doing a lot of uh, development in agriculture for Madagascar. They got this really big uh, uh, grant in Madagascar and they created this association that is for developing more sustainable agriculture. So that's at a national level. And then at more local levels, you've got lots of NGOs that are like, or, or businesses like the vanilla companies who are trying to promote a switch to more sustainable techniques. You know, part of it is just like, this is traditional. This is what they grew up doing. This is what they know how to do. It's no different from, you know, a lot of the ways that people learn here and we adopt, you know, farming practices here in the U.S. that this is what, how we've been farming. So this is how we continue to farm. We know we need to change, right? So the same thing is happening in Madagascar and it's just going to take some time to, um, 
to realize that there that these other methods can actually also produce more food. And so it's not just about conserving the forest and conserving lemurs, it's about producing more food. But it takes time to get that kind of message out in such a remote place. Yeah. I have, there's two messages there that I want to harp on before our last few questions. One is this idea that, again, these solutions are global now. And I think that, you know, when I was a kid, if I thought about Madagascar, if I thought about Australia and the solutions and things going on there, I would have thought, oh, very different, you know, completely foreign things to what we're doing here in Canada. And it's simply not the case. I think you illustrated that so beautifully, the, the education programs, getting kids you know, fascinated with this, with the creatures in the local neck of the woods. So uh, the same sort of things that as teachers, you guys might be doing in classrooms, the same sort of things that you might be seeing in your local park and nature areas, those are solutions that can be implemented in Madagascar, in Brazil, everywhere, and really make a positive difference. And I love, too, that you mentioned this idea that it brings more food as well. This is the thing with building up natural ecosystems and getting the community involved, is that it's not just good for the planet, it's good for us. And I think that there's been this disconnect between those two things for too long, and we're starting to realize, you know, wow, if we have healthy reefs, that, that gives better fisheries, it gives more tourism opportunity, it does all these good things for everybody. I think that's a really nice message to highlight. Um, that's exactly what Everard is, is really trying to teach with his new generation. I mean, it's it's not a big area. We're talking about maybe two acres, three yeah. acres, you know, and, and he's really only producing on a half acre, I'd say. Yeah. So if you think about that from a farming perspective for people here in the U.S., a half an acre, that sounds like nothing to most people, except the people who have really learned to make the most out of a small space. And that's what Everard's doing. Yeah. He uses like this multi-story approach where you've got the trees with the vines climbing and the lower shrub levels, it's, it's really, really amazing. I bet, I'm excited to see more and do more programs on this, fantastic. Yeah. Um, Izzy's been sharing a question in our chat bar. So Izzy wants to know, has there been a difference of when you began and when you knew the project was a success uh, in terms of lemur populations or, or lowering their, their endangered status? Have they become more or less endangered since you started? How are you measuring all that? That's that's a tough one. Um, sadly to say, lemur through my time, which is, you know, I, I've only been in the game for a short time compared to a lot of the other experts who have seen it from, you know, early research till now. And for, even in the short, you know, 10 years or so that I've been in this uh, field, yeah, the number of endangered species has just increased exponentially. And it's more because we've learned uh, that, you know, what we used to think was one species was really more like 10. Um, and so what we thought was a species that had a very broad range now is actually a very uh, small range and isolated and that forest is disappearing so quickly that that's why we think they're endangered. You know, there's now a turning of the tide back the other way to show, hey, you know, some of these species, maybe not different species. So we're seeing, it, we're, it's a very active time. And sadly, like I said, it's, it's a time of, we're learning more and more just how endangered they are. Now that's the sad part of it. Also sad is, you know, with some of the growing uh, data sets where we have over the years, we can actually track and see that in some cases hunting is increasing, like in the last five years and especially in the last two years with the economic crisis. In some of the places where we've been collecting data and I know colleagues have been collecting data, they're showing increases in hunting. Um, you know, where they're monitoring lemurs, sometimes they're steady, sometimes they're declining. Other species are doing great, don't get me wrong. There are certain species that are really prolific breeders, can live in very um, diverse habitats, so they're okay, but there are a lot of very specialized lemurs, and that's, sadly, that's what we're learning, is they're so specialized and so endangered that we've really got to act fast. Uh, I'm really glad that you highlighted that. I mean, it's not all peaches and cream in conservation. There's a lot of big challenges happening, and in a lot of cases, biodiversity has dropped quite a bit uh, around the world. But what certainly that we're seeing is that there are more solutions being shared around the globe. There is certainly an upwelling of support from kids the ages of, of those in this broadcast today. I mean, there's never been a generation more uh, active in, in promoting this and in trying to really hold leaders to account. And so I think there's some really heartening signs. Some of the trends might be bad for a bit, but I think we're going to start seeing a real upswing and some positive stories in the years to come, which is really exciting. Um, probably flies and we're having fun. We've got time for one more question from Mr. Audie's class, so come on in and unmute your mic, and you can wrap up our broadcast with us. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, so this question comes from Anve. He's just wondering if there are equal opportunities for both uh, male and female students, or if you're finding that um, the opportunities are equal, and if not, what would be the next steps? Um, to make sure that everybody has the same opportunity to education within your programs and the roles after. Fantastic question. Yeah, definitely a great question. It can be really, really challenging, and we try to always be very aware of that in recruiting students to be part of our programs. 
So, I mean, there, there's a certain aspect of it is just you're starting with a pool that's already kind of biased. It's going to be sometimes 50-50 men and women, but sometimes it's more like 75% men and 25% women. And so that can be really hard. And we're just we're always trying to be cognizant of keeping it 50-50. Even when I see that we've we've now recruited, you know, a really great pool of students. If I see that it's imbalanced, I say, hey, come on, we need to we need to try to find a few more women students. It can be hard simply because there just aren't as many in the school, um, but it can also be hard because they end up with tons of responsibilities at home, like helping out with their family. And there's a, there's a lot of different elements of it, but we just have to, I mean, there's probably better ways of, of ensuring this equal opportunity. I just try to always be aware and say, hey, look, you know, we need at least 50, 50, if not, if not just all women doing a, a women only kind of event. One of the things we've seen with some other partners in the past, uh, Proyecto TD, they're in Colombia. They do really amazing work engaging girls in, in conservation. And in East Africa, during our Global BioFest, there were so many programs highlighting the, the role of women as rangers, as educators, as community leaders. Basically, Mr. Adi, you hit the nail on the head. Where women are more involved in conservation programs, they do better universally around the world. Um, one of the great people for this, I want to have you bring up her names. So you can check her out when we're done. Gonsalves. Dominique Gonsalves is in Mozambique. She does incredible work protecting elephants there. She's a National Geographic Educator, and I really encourage you to check out her program for this as well. James, this has been so much fun, man. Thank you so much again for, for joining us and sharing your enthusiasm. Such great programs. I'll bring up again the website that people can check out. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having you again on soon. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be on. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you for joining me.